program was made possible by the Florida Humanities Council. We come from all over, and we become one state, where we share in the history and become part of the culture that is Florida. The Florida Humanities Council, bringing Floridians together by sharing the stories of our state. Florida, a tropical paradise, a land of sunshine, a state of dreams. Before the U.S. entered the Second World War, Florida was a remote and isolated state, the smallest in the South. Today, Florida is the fourth largest state, with more than 18 and a half million residents. What does Florida do? Florida grows, and uh, it's, it's a growth machine. But all is not perfect in this paradise. Traffic, overdevelopment, aging, immigration, and the environment are mounting concerns. During the last half of the 20th century, the story of modern Florida is one of astonishing growth. Florida is the southernmost outcropping of North America, the northernmost edge of the Caribbean. Here, all things seem possible. Wet is made dry. Crooked rivers made straight, hot made cool. One, and the old backflip, are made young up, again. Add a girl, see? <laughs> I just feel as though it's a new life for me. Because you work all your life and raise your family and do all those things. And all of a sudden, you're old. So I came to Florida and I dyed my hair blonde and I bought a convertible. These days, most Floridians live a short car ride from the coastline. Most of the residents, in fact, uh, had come from the South, from Georgia, Alabama. Uh, there's a wonderful story. They asked the governor of Georgia in the 1920s. So many Georgians had moved to Florida, and they asked the governor what impact this was having. And he replied, And then along came World War II. The laughter in their faces tells you that they're enjoying every moment of their ship in the blue waters of the warm Gulf of Mexico. Well, Florida was the smallest state in the South prior to World War II. Uh, it had 1.9 million people. The war brings in 2.2 million people. And suddenly, overnight, the population is larger than the population that lived here, and they're from all over the country. 
and they're coming here to be trained for the war. Around Florida's Big Bend, young recruits conquered the Wakulla River and the high dive at Wakulla Springs. Under fire, they land. And at Amphibian Training Center in Florida, these are the latest tactics for invading from the sea. At Camp Gordon Johnston, soldiers hit the beaches at Carabelle and Dog Island in preparation for the invasion of Normandy. Flaps are up. Here's coming up. World War II transformed Florida because of the role of the military. Wings over Florida soon became a familiar sight. Most residents could uh, discern the noise and the profile of a P-38 Lightning or a P-51 Mustang. From the backwoods to the beaches, Florida was home to 200 military installations. Magdill Field, Camp Blanding, Pensacola Naval Air Station, the Sop Choppy Bombing Range, Buckingham Field. So where Florida had been a poor state, a small state, it suddenly became, thanks to the investment of the federal government, a fairly dynamic state with an infrastructure in place that could begin to accommodate quite a few people going to discover it during the war years. I fell in love with Florida right there because, frankly, this boy from New Jersey had never seen such wonderful climate, sunshine. I love tangerines and oranges. And, uh, it was a great little village in Gainesville with a wonderful school. And I said, one day, when it's right, I'm going to live in Florida. The great change in Florida in World War II was that was exposure. Millions and millions of servicemen, their wives, workers had come to Florida and had been so impressed with what they found. They had images of Florida that had circulated in their papers, particularly during wintertime. This image of this beautiful landscape, uh, the sun, the sea, uh, the palm trees. Florida, where you get school credit for learning to water ski. It was like going to heaven. It was so wonderful. Um, we, we were able to go swimming in the wintertime. It was just beautiful, because there were so many trees and flowers. When, up north, they were having snow. The war ended in 1945. When the GIs returned home, they were filled with dreams. They wanted to get married, get a job, go to school, buy a house, take a vacation. It was one of the most hopeful times in America's history. Florida's most enduring symbols. And to Florida's misery, so was the mosquito. To make Florida more livable, an all-out war was waged on insects. The weapon of choice, a powerful new wartime pesticide, DDT. On the matter of making Florida more inviting, there was all that water to the south. There was just too much of it, especially when it stormed. Hideous, unrelenting, shrieking its rage, the vicious scourge of mankind, burying life and land under its relentless and merciless depths. In 1948, Florida and the federal government came up with a comprehensive flood control plan. 
was set into motion soon after the dedication of the Everglades National Park. A new federal designation was supposed to protect and preserve the fragile Everglades for future generations. Ironically, it didn't work out that way. This is the story of such water, and it's mastery by the determined hand of man. Over the next 30 years, the Army Corps of Engineers would drastically change the hydrology of South and Central Florida. The single greatest folly in Florida environmental history is unquestionably uh, our relationship with the Everglades. It validates the ability of the Army Corps of Engineers to, to remake the, uh, the wet Florida landscape. Central and Southern Florida is no longer nature's fool. The stooge for the impractical jokes of the elements. But the work isn't finished. In fact, it's just really begun. Just prior to the decades of growth that would come to define modern Florida, 1949 was a milestone, along with the state's first sales tax. But the frontier ends the very same year as the space age begins. On the Atlantic coast at Cape Canaveral, the Banana River Naval Air Station, an old World War II outpost, got a new name, the Joint Long Range Proving Grounds. In the summer of 1950, Cape Canaveral proved its worth. The historic launch of a captured German V-2 rocket propelled America into the front line of space. Much like the events at the Cape, Florida tourism was taking off too. Florida's Silver Springs is to the south what Niagara Falls is to the east and Grand Canyon is to the west. A truly spectacular natural attraction. The Florida vacation had arrived. The exotic appeal of the Sunshine State and America's love affair with the automobile proved to be a perfect match. In the wild, the real Florida was a masterpiece. Crystal clear springs were home to wondrous creatures big and small. Birds and alligators thrived in untouched rivers and swamps. From north to south, thick hammocks and marshy wetlands shared a seemingly endless landscape with panthers, palmettos, and pines. Along the inaccessible panhandle coastline, beautiful sugar sand beaches and magnificent sand dunes lay undisturbed. What we would not see around 1950 is a lot of people. The population in Florida was under three million. The state was a peninsula of empty roads and highways. As late as 1950, Florida was actually younger than rest of America. Although a paradise, Florida was about to get even better. Introduced in 1951, it was called the Room Air Conditioner. The rattling metal box was expensive and slow to catch on, but climate control was here to stay. Florida was now the fastest growing state in America. While Northern Florida remained true to its Southern ways and rural lifestyle, on the lower end of the peninsula, sleepy old Florida was about to get a wake-up call.
him of tomorrow, the dream in his heart of living in the warm, sunny tropics. There is perhaps no more ideal community in America than the bustling seaside city of Pompano Beach, Florida. Along with the hard-to-resist notion of owning a piece of paradise, Florida was attractive for another reason. It was affordable. For example, these homes range in price from $8,000. Homes are designed for casualness, so you may wander with ease. Florida was a dream state for the working class. A hundred years from now, we'll look back, especially on the 1950s, even the decades from the 1950s to about 2000, as kind of a golden age for the working and the middle classes who migrated here. Where some saw sand and swamp, others saw an instant city. So then, here's the drama. My metaphysics, let me be perfectly frank with you, are that there is the central self, you can call it God, you can call it anything you like. And it's all of us. It's playing all the parts of all beings whatsoever, everywhere and anywhere. And it's playing the game of hide and seek with itself. It gets lost, it gets involved in the farthest out adventures, but in the end, it always wakes up and comes back to itself. And when you are ready to wake up, you're going to wake up. And if you're not ready, you're going to stay pretending that you're just a little, poor little me. And uh, since you're all here and engaged in this sort of inquiry and listening to this sort of lecture, I assume that you're all on the process of waking up. Or else you're teasing yourselves with some kind of uh, flirtation with waking up, which you're not serious about. But I assume yeah, maybe you are not serious but sincere, that you are ready to wake up. So then, when you're in the way of waking up and finding out who you really are, you meet a character called a guru. As the Hindus say, this word, the teacher, the awakener. And what is the function of a guru? He's the man who looks at you in the eye and says, oh, come off it. <laughs> I know who you are. You know, you come to the guru and say, sir, I have a problem. I'm unhappy and I want to get one up on the universe or I want to become enlightened. I want spiritual wisdom. Ah, and the guru looks at you and says, who are you? You know, Sri Ramana Maharshi, that great Hindu sage of modern times, people used to come to him and say, Master, who was I in my last incarnation? As if that mattered. And he would say, who is asking the question? And he'd look at you and say, basically, go right down to it. You're looking at me, you're looking out, and you're unaware of what's behind your eyes. One of Florida's first post-war instant cities was Cape Coral. Eager customers swarmed model homes, then boarded small planes to pick out their home sites. I took one look and I said, that's it. This new city near Fort Myers was the inspiration of two brothers, Leonard and Julius Rosen. Cape Coral has been planned as a hometown, free from the mistakes of yesterday. 